when you compare uh, the Chinese Communist Party, its performance against some of the other uh, communist parties, uh, what do you think is the for secret formula of uh, CPC's success? It's a, it's a great question, and it's probably historians will be looking at this over the next century and more, because it is, as I said, a remarkable success story given the disasters of the first 30 years of the People's Republic. And yet, uh, you know, I think Deng Xiaoping, all of these individuals deserve such enormous credit for going back to the vision, really one of the central initial visions of Marx, uh, that communism actually has a material basis. It's not purely an idea or an ideal, uh, and that communism does not have to mean poverty. It can mean development. It can mean economic development uh, in a way that, uh, again, Chinese leaders of the first half of the 20th century uh, would have understood very well and in many cases would have applauded. Again, I have to go back to Sun Yat-sen because he's underappreciated. The communism we see in China today is much closer to what Sun Yat-sen would call mm -hmm. uh, the, the livelihood of the people, taking people's livelihood as the center. You know, this is what uh, former Premier Wang Jiabao uh, used to say in a different way, Yi uh, Ren Wei Ban, you keep, have people as your foundation. This is a different approach, quite frankly, to the communalist and idealist approach to communism that marked China in the 1950s, 60s, and in the first half of the 1970s. And talking about the word and the concept communism, uh, it is, of course, uh, believed to be one of the most uh, loaded um, words in international relations. Uh, Chomsky famously said that uh, anti-communism is a national ideology in the United States and the Western society at large. Uh, there has been waves of red scares starting from the 1920s and 30s, uh, most recently uh, the new Cold War against China, uh, the new red scare launched by Trump and Pompeo. Um, do you think the Chinese Communist Party in some ways has redefined uh, the concept, uh, the connotation of communism. One of the reasons for American anti-communism uh, and the spread of it in the 1950s in particular was the fear and the belief then, rightly or wrongly, uh, that this was part of a global ideology led by the Soviet Union and then later by China also, uh, that sought a form of global domination. Right or wrong, that was widely believed in the West, certainly widely believed in, in Europe uh, as well at that time. Uh, and indeed, you know, communism was a powerful, perhaps the most powerful global ideological movement of the 20th century. You know, the Chinese Communist Party, when it was founded in 1921, uh, was founded in part by uh, 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 agents of the Communist International from Moscow, who were not just Russian, but international communists who believe that the future of the world would be a communist world. That movement as an international, as a powerful and united international movement really fell apart really at the latest in 1960 with the Chinese Soviet break. That ends international communism as a coherent uh, movement. And China really goes its own path and a quite different path after 1978 and the Soviet Union continues on a different path. But international communism basically is over as a movement today. Uh, this is why one, one, I think, should take your, your comment quite uh, in, uh, correctly. That is, that is, communism per se is not something that one can, one does not fear, for example, here in Lexington, Massachusetts, where I'm, from which I'm talking to, the birthplace of American liberty. There's not a great anti-communist fear here. Uh, nor is there, quite frankly, despite some rhetoric you hear anywhere in the United States, but it remains a rhetorical tool used by those uh, who wish, who either fear the unknown or fear the rise of a powerful China in this case. All right, uh, Professor Kirby, you said in your book, Can China Lead? And you actually answered the question about whether, uh, you know, the first 21st century will be uh, the China century. In the book, you said uh, it can be the Chinese century, but not China alone. Uh, what did you mean by that? Well, I, I mean by that is that China is, of course, going to be one of the leading powers in the world. 
extraordinarily and rightfully influential in virtually every matter of global significance. Um, but global leadership today, and I think the Americans uh, have experienced this, is not capable by walling yourself off uh, from the rest of the world or putting your own country first compared to anyone else. Uh, China experienced that in the 1960s uh, as well. But again, the rise of China is because of, not despite, its integration in international currents. The rise of China is because of and not in spite of international currents, whether it's international communism that leads to the founding of the Chinese Communist Party in 1921, uh, whether it's part of the anti-fascist war uh, of the late 1930s and 1940s, or whether it's part of being one of the socialist brother countries allied with the Soviet Union in the 1950s, which helps China's development enormously in industrial terms. And then China's re-engagement with the international economic community after 1978, and again after 2002 with uh, WTO, China's rise is inescapable from international engagement. And so it is only with partners that China has been successful. And it has been remarkably successful because of its capacity to build uh, and make partnerships, not just with the Soviet Union first, not just with the United States and Western Europe later, but now also with many parts of the, the, the world that we used to call the third world with Africa and Central Asia and South Asia. Mm -hmm.